I had to know after watching 13 Assassins, is Dead Alive still the movie with the most movie blood in it? And apparently it is. But I feel like that's just because it wasn't measured in 13 Assassins. Yeah. You know? Like 13 Assassins had to have more. Maybe the international measurement got all, you know, messed up as well. Going from metric to imperial. So apparently it still holds the record with over 300 liters used for that final scene with the chainsaw where everything goes, or not the chainsaw, the lawnmower, the famous lawnmower scene where everything just goes crazy. I mean, that makes sense though. It, it's pretty gratuitous. It, it doesn't like, you don't wonder where all of this blood has gone. When you look at like the invoice or anything like that for the movie, so uh, <laughs> like it's all there. It's there for sure. It's all definitely in there. It, it kind of feels like also in Dead Alive they squeezed a lot of that blood in the last like half of the movie. Oh, for sure. It, in- it definitely ramps up. I'm thinking now, just of like in our experience, what are some of like the bloodiest movies we we think we've seen measured by oh. the liter amount or like the liquid amount? Excuse me of prop blood used i mean kill bill has got to be up there nightmare three or nightmare two one of those on elm street or what what do you mean yeah the jo- okay. the johnny depp one i was like okay. is there a movie called nightmare that i've never heard of no 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 no, no. The, the nightmare on elm street like two or really three, the i don't john- i haven't seen those in so long i don't remember them being bloody i remember the johnny depp one the dream scene when he gets sucked into the bed yeah. and they're like, and it's like the blood that's coming out of the bed. And that had to have been like 200 mm. gallons. He's like jockey football player boy. And he gets absolutely yeah, I mean, that was, shredded. I mean, until dead alive, that was the most blood I had seen in a movie period was like, I mean, I think 13 assassins had more. Uh, I mean, 13 assassins I mean, literally had that tidal wave of blood. Yeah, but it was more like roof. tactile and like made sense to the narrative that was going on, and so it like it, it definitely was very bloody. But I don't know for for Dead Alive, it's like there was scenes where it's just like, all right, just keep squirting it for an extra few seconds, well, yeah, boys. It's, the movie is about being as being as excessive as possible in like every way and continually ramping up that excess. To the point where at the end it's just a fucking Looney Tunes carnival of limbs flying and guts becoming sentient and just all kinds of nonsense. Like the garden gnome. I love the garden gnome zombie. The uncle like shoves that garden gnome into its neck. And oh, you just yeah. see like all the pus and blood fly out and then it's just walking around with a garden gnome for a head. Yeah, yeah. it's great. <laughs> this movie's great. <laughs> That's one of the most, the, sh- the best things about the movie is the like not only the practical effects but the practicality of the effects. Like you said, like oh, 30 minutes go by or not 30 minutes, excuse me, like 5 10 minutes go by and you're like, "Oh yeah, there's a zombie now with just a garden gnome in its neck." Like it does that a lot in this movie and I love that aspect of it. Yeah, the zombies a lot of the time take st- like parts of the environment with them. They like walk around with like a piece of like whatever they had like fallen into and died with. Yes, or, like, yeah. like, like, they always like have a little bit of personality. Each little zombie. Yeah. There are the generic. There are definitely they the do. generic zombies for sure. There are just ones that like, Ugh. but there are a lot of zombies that like every when the camera clips to them for even that one frame. You can see their whole story, boom, right there, and like how they died. That's an amazing statement, Jeff. You're right. You're completely right, and that that's like, that's a part that I never really considered, but it is why uh, this movie is so charming in in some way. It's charming in a lot of ways, but in in terms of like the zombies, like you have the uh, the wild like romance angle going on with the priest and the yeah. Nurse. I was gonna say. Oh my god. So. Honestly, probably the most disgusting part of the movie. Yeah. So, by the way, today we're talking about Dead Alive, a.k.a. Brain Dead, 1992 Peter Jackson film. If you don't know who Peter Jackson is, 
he went on to make the Lord of the Rings a mere eight years later after what this like splatter masterpiece. And uh, it's possibly my favorite movie. Jeff hadn't seen it before, which I consider a personal failing on my part that I had not shown it to him. Not his part. I just assumed. I don't know why I assumed, but I, I loved watching it with you and <laughs> like seeing you begin to love it. I'm curious, like if you could tell us, like if you were at a line graph or, or something like, you know, how was the how was the experience? Because it's not often you get to see Dead Alive for the first time. That's very true. I mean, I don't know. For me, Dead Alive was a movie that was kind of confusing at first because it starts kind of like a Spanish telenovela. And and I mean, well, actually, it doesn't start that way. It starts with a quite promising scene of, of you know, he's the bite. And, and Singaya. Some, and, Singaya. <laughs> and, so, and, the, and some nice dismemberment. And so you're like, yeah. all right, cool, I'm strapped in. And then it goes, it proceeds to go into... Solid 30 minutes of a kind of goofy romance drama. And I'm looking over at Jesse like, this is your favorite movie? This is the movie that you love. This yeah. is the, the standard of B-movie splatter. It is the gold standard. And I mean, I waited patiently and I was rewarded. I mean, this movie is... It's fun. It's like going to a cheap amusement park where the floor is sticky and you got gum on your feet and it smells like old popcorn and puke and you're just like riding your favorite roller coaster. Really selling it a thousand times. No, but like that's the environment. But you, but you love it because it's got your favorite roller coaster that you rode when you're with your dad back when the when the boardwalk was still nice. (laughs) Uh, and and right. stuff like that, and it's, so it's like you have all these memories attached to it, but it still has this era of mm. just like grossness and and vile, disgusting. I don't know. It's just this movie is so tactilely gross. And, it's disgusting and, and, and in the best way possible. It's disgusting. It's not scary. Like if you're scared of this movie, you're probably very young. You know, I don't think anyone over the age of like fourteen would be scared of this. But it is gross, and it's uh, yeah. I mean, there are so many scenes to point to, like I mean, when the mom becomes a zombie and she eats her own ear, and like squirts pus into the guy's pudding. <laughs> yeah, oh, <laughs> they had so barf funny. bags in theaters in like Spain, I think, somewhere, something like that. It's a good idea. I mean, the custard scene is like my favorite scene in the film, and I think one of my favorite scenes in all of cinema. Do you like watching the fat man eat custard in glorious detail? Yeah. I mean, it's like, he's hilarious, first off. I like the idea of the pus being so urgently, like, expulsed from her hand that it flies into his pus (laughs) and he just keeps eating it. Into his custard. Into his custard, yeah. Yeah. Into his custard. You can't really tell. The point is that I mean Alex makes a good point right there is that you can't really tell the difference. It becomes just disgusting. I remember you were mentioning Alex the sound. prior. Yeah, the, the the scene held some kind of significance for you because of just like how tactilely disgusting it was. Oh yeah, I mean the you hear like the clinking of the spoon and like you know when you eat something and you're you're kind of inhaling at the same time as taking a bite. Oh, so when it's dog. liquid you get that like bubbly kind of suction sound mm, when that you bubbly eat. slurpiness. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and Do we have legit like lost listeners. It's it, right it's now? cool like, because it's like a cartoon. You know, it's like only you, yeah. you almost imagine that scene of pus getting like shooting out of her hand into this dude's custard <laughs> in a cartoon. <laughs> It reminds me of like I'm when thinking South about people Park... who haven't seen this movie and have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> I mean, like, it's a legendary oh scene. God. It has to be yeah, a legendary true, scene. Yeah, I mean, it just reminds me of like when <sighs> like things like South Park or other shows of their like decide to like take it up to eleven for a few minutes. Oh yeah. yeah. By the way, this full movie right now is available on YouTube in good quality and has been for a couple of years. So I'm comfortable saying, if you haven't seen it, and this sounds like fun, like fun zombie splatter nonsense go watch it on youtube and then come back we'll wait yes definitely we'll wait yeah, yeah we'll for wait. sure i mean it's just yeah i mean it's just it's this perfect blend of just like 
of always being at 11. This movie, even it, its drama and its like silly telenovela stuff I was mentioning, is still pretty ramped up. It's 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 very dramatic. Like I could see if the whole movie was that drama and it wasn't a splatter movie, I could see that doing pretty well in that type of audience, if that makes any Hmm. sense. I don't know. It is like, it's also at the same time as being kind of overly dramatic. It's also very silly. Like Lionel is just the klutziest klutz that's ever klutzed. Yeah. I mean, the world is kind of like that though. The world is a little silly, a little, I don't want to say old school, but it's a little nostalgic. It feels a little throwback, you know, even the well, way that early they 90s, you know, late no, 80s, but like, early 90s, even the town that they're living in. It feels a little bit older than that. The cars and like the lorries that go by and stuff like that yeah, are well, like, you, yeah, old cars. Well, it's New Zealand. So, you know, you got to have to consideration that's an island. So it's, you know, oh, back then I was probably was a little farther behind for even the 90s. Those backwards ass Kiwis. <laughs> oh, <stop. laughs> I, feel, I feel like that helps the uh, the vibe of the movie a little bit and like the story because it's like it's almost like dreamlike. It takes yes. you into this place that's almost like imaginative, and then you have the addition of the soap opera like music and storyline that adds to it, and then obviously the main part is the juxtaposition and the clash of the fact that there's just gore and guts and blood like interspersed in all of that and i love how lionel is trying to like tamp it all down the whole time it felt very like monty python british humor type thing like you know keep yeah, calm like carry pretending on it doesn't exist yeah <laughs> i mean there's a there's definitely a level of like slice out of reality to this world Especially when it comes to Lionel and the relationship with his mother, which I found to be the only part of the movie that I think was trying to say something, if anything at all. Yeah. Which was like, you know, this man is being held at like a a kind of a a permanent state of childlike naivety by his mother, which ends up kind of being his benefit as his like hero's sword because he proceeds to go through the movie kind of with this naive bumbling that tends to keep him out of trouble, keep him out of harm's way. Well, you you called it plot armor when we were watching it, because it's like everyone gets so easily bitten and becomes a zombie, but he just like has his, has the menagerie of zombies he keeps in the basement and like feeds them cereal. And it's like, it's like, it's so strange, but he never gets bit. It's very Mr. Magoo. Like, the way he's almost, like, kind of slips through. Yeah, Mr. Bean or something. Yeah, the way he slips through the zombie's grasp constantly and is never quite in enough danger where he, he even seems that concerned. He always kind of has a certain level of, oh, no, this is bad. Yeah. This is bad. <clears throat> That's his general attitude the whole movie as the world completely ends around him. Did you guys enjoy that scene when he's at the table feeding them all cereal? <laughs> All the zombies. <laughs> you know, that that's where I really started to get like the Edgar Wright echoing, you know, or other way around. But where you can see mm. Shaun of the Dead, you know, like the whole scene at the end of the movie of Shaun of the Dead where he has Nick Frost in the basement, right, tied up. Yes. He's like he like <laughs> brings games. him some stuff and, and they start playing video games together. And like he almost bites him and everything like that. But he's like no, this is just the life we're going to have to live now. That's like Lionel in the entire movie. He's like trying to keep his mom li- alive, everything. Well, that had to have been a direct nod. I mean, I think so, yeah, which is cool. You're right, is definitely a fan of Dead Alive. I yeah, can say yeah, that I mean, without researching it whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that was definitely a nod to Dead Alive right there at the end, was like kind of keeping him there as like this best friend zombie because that's this whole movie is Lionel trying to maintain these people's normal life as they descend into not only zombies, but like, like just monsters. Oh my God. The, so yeah, the priest who we'll, we'll talk about the priest, but, um, just the, he and the nurse zombie fuck. And they give birth to a little baby zombie. Oh, God. <laughs> oh my God. That was when I thought I was like going insane. 
Yeah, this is all things that happen in this movie. Um, and then Lionel takes it for a walk in the park. <laughs> And just like it's it's like misbehaving, so he's just like beating the shit out of it. He's like throwing it around, and you can tell it's obviously just a guy with like a doll <laughs> running around, like slamming it into like swing sets and stuff. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Oh, it's so beautifully B movie. It's so perfectly like oh well. We're going to have you just like run around and smash this doll around in this park in and what's obviously LA. Oh no, it was probably New Zealand. Yeah, it was New Zealand. He was yeah, it was definitely New Zealand. Duh. Um, <laughs> and it's like which makes it even better because you know it's not like LA where like people are like okay, this is just another movie. So you know that there was like a crowd of people around just like the fuck is going on here? Seriously. I mean, there was like no film industry in new zealand when peter jackson was starting out when he when he made bad taste his first feature he basically just did it all on his own with his friends and made all of the practical effects and everything himself and that's only that was only released like three years before dead alive so i'm gonna say like if there was a film industry in new zealand by that time it would still be very very small so people weren't used to that do you think that like he actually got permits and stuff for Dead Alive, or do you think that a lot of it was like just like guerrilla filmmaking? Uh, I think by Dead Alive, he was definitely getting some money. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I know, and Alive? I also know that that scene, the baby scene, was filmed after everything else, and he had money left over, so he used that to go shoot the park scene, and it ended up being his personal favorite uh, scene <laughs> in the movie. <laughs> I can see um, why. I don't know the budget. Let me look. Three million. That tracks yeah. for 1992. And uh, it's worth saying as well, like the practical effects in this movie are fucking incredible. They're so gross. You can taste them and smell them. And Hair it's not em. like horrifying. It's just like hilariously gross. Yeah. Well, yeah. 2.9 million went to the practical effects. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, man. The effect of, and especially like the claymation rat monkey. Oh, God. Oh, man. Oh god! I totally <laughs> it's like I keep forgetting about that, and then you keep bringing it up again. I don't know, Alex. You want to go first? I mean, yeah, we talked we talked about this a little bit before, but like just the idea that the caretakers at this fucking zoo, you know, have like normal monkeys coming in, bonobos, maybe like spider monkeys. Mm, what other varieties of monkeys are there? Pangolins, which are just like little tiny ones. Oh, interesting. Um, I can't think of the and then and then Sumatran rat monkeys. And then all of a sudden, you have this monstrosity of an animal, and you're like, "Yeah, we'll give it its own exhibit. People will come." And what do you mean? That this. thing's so handsome looking. And you know the way that it bites the mother and everything, the way she deals with it, it's just like a mosquito bit her or something. She's like, "Shoo away now, creature." I just love how it's the first big effect that you see, and it's like some of the worst, most hilarious claymation ever. Yeah. Like a stop motion claymation. I love that aspect, though, of the movie, the, how they set that up. The beginning part of it being like some foreign entity or like disease. Well, how the rat monkey is set up by the zookeeper is one of the more memorable parts in the movie to me. That zookeeper is... <laughs> insane the way he comes just right up into the scene he's just like you want some exposition <laughs> yeah and he's just like and like the fact that they chose rape to be like they could have chosen so many things for the for the rat monkeys to have done to infect the area but the fact that they just like came in and raped all the other monkeys yeah. the rats <laughs> did there were such big rats that they raped little tree monkeys from slave ships or something like that yeah that's yeah. probably it was just the most insane origin story <laughs> <laughs> yeah the rats came scuttling off the ship and raped all the little tree monkeys yeah. you're like what <laughs> what the fuck what is this and that's movie? Lionel's face as well. He's just like, wait, what the fuck is this guy talking about? <laughs> yeah, and then it bites mom. Mom bites others. And then it goes crazy. Yeah. She eats she eats Paquita's dog, which is a great scene. But the great one of the one of the best lines in the movie. Yeah. Oh, your mother ate my dog. <laughs> and he's like, not all of it. Yeah, <laughs> yes, he takes out like the carcass. <laughs> he just like slowly pulls the drained carcass out of her mouth yeah like, not all of it 
Yeah, that was the name of the name of the movie in Spain, I believe. Um, your mother and my dog. <laughs> I love how that translates into other languages, the movie titles and things like that. Yeah. But going off yeah. of something that Jeff said, I always had this theory of this movie of like the arrested development thing with the mother, the restricted development, you know, it's like at the very end, she gets her wish and literally her womb opens up and eats him alive. And then he's able to burst out of it and be his like, quote unquote, own man. (laughs) Yeah. It's a movie where the, uh, (laughs) The mom literally becomes like, she's like the the final boss zombie at the end. And she's this enormous, like, I don't know, uh, like monstrosity of, of practical effects and plasters and whatever. Yeah. It's really crazy because it's like you see it fall apart in segments. So it's like, wow, a lot of work went into that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, she literally drags him back into the womb and says... No one will ever love you like your mother. <laughs> <laughs> this movie makes me laugh. Like I was like giggling the whole time. It's I've probably seen it more than anything else, but I hadn't I hadn't seen it in a while. When did you first see it? I was probably like seventeen, something like that. And sixteen. Did you just fall in love with it immediately? Oh yeah. Well, it's like I had friends who were very much into the same things as me, like. We went to fucking like hardcore shows and we're into like goth punk type of stuff. God, so hardcore shows, I don't like that. What? Oh, okay. You meant music. Music, yeah. Sorry. What did I say? I some... You said hardcore shows. I thought. Oh, you were meaning yeah. No, like yeah, hardcore, music. hardcore music, hardcore punk rock. <laughs> okay. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> I wasn't like, going to was like, like donkey dude, shows at of... age sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I didn't know that about you, bro. <laughs> no, nah, we're just like dudes with who were edgy with black hair and liked horror movies, you know? So I was shown it then and I was like, this is fucking amazing. It's so funny. Yeah. Well, it also holds um, an important thing, like standard, I guess, where you really can compare all B movies to this movie. Oh, definitely. That, that's why I wanted to do it. I was like, not only is it the poster on our, on our poster, <laughs> it's poster on our poster, <laughs> But it's like, it is, like we've said before, it is the gold standard, at least in my opinion. It's like, it's the point of comparison to which all other B-movie schlock shall be judged, because this is the the masterpiece. It's not necessarily shot like B-movie schlock, though. It's, It's well shot, and you can tell that, like, the director is very present in his film, and he, Peter Jackson is like, I don't know. You can just tell that he's like a good filmmaker and he relies on traditional shots and things like that sometimes in addition oh, to his Oh, he knows what he's style. doing. Exactly. He totally knows what he's doing. He knows where to place the camera to emphasize the emotion of a scene like or to make it as comedic as possible. Like this is really good low budget filmmaking. It's fantastic. You can see the origins of the person who made Lord of the Rings. You actually can. Yeah. I which mean, is interesting to say. The beginning is is especially, like, with some of, like, the flowery music and the emotional stuff, the way that it's shot, I'm like, wow, I feel like Frodo or Sam is going to bumble into the room mm-hmm. at this very moment, you know? Hop onto the bed with Frodo. <laughs> you guys are bringing up... <laughs> oh, God. You guys are share the load. You guys are bringing up an interesting point where... I've always kind of thought like what makes a B movie? I know it's a very generic question. It's a very argued question about like what exactly are the components to make something a B movie? Cause you kind of just pointed out there, Alex is we have something that is very obviously a B movie and just even said that, but that it's not a bad a st- movie, but it's not a bad movie. And you even said a low budget movie and that even might might be a distinction of its own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But but we've kind of just came to the determination that it's not about having a bad director or an inept director or having everybody be in uh, unaware of how bad something is like Samurai Cop. Or Samurai Cop's a really hilarious B-movie, a really hilarious bad movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, like The Room is a legendary B-movie, but in no way shape or form does it ever come close to the actual 
mechanical filmmaking technique of Dead Alive. No, the room the room is a B movie, but it's also a bad movie. Exactly. It's it's so bad that it comes back around and becomes amazing. And those are like those are really rare things. And that's not what you know, this Dead movie Alive is. Dead Alive it just no, this is this is a B movie in that it's like a B budget and it's like a schlocky it, it's it's a it's about, you know, decapitations and zombies getting like destroyed by lawnmowers and like all this other nonsense you have a, the priest character he starts kicking ass in the graveyard and fighting the the punk rocker zombies <laughs> and he's like i kick ass for the lord and you're like oh yes <laughs> best scene in the movie and at the same well, time yeah. it's like this movie is amazing yeah it's technically really competent um well directed well made it just is a b category yeah because of its nature you know and I think that this conversation is really important going forward when we talk about B movies and when people listen to us talk about B movies, because I think a lot of people in general, in layman's terms, would think B movie equals bad movie. Either the B stands for bad or they just don't understand how that kind of categorization works. And it's just not always the case. And I think that this is such a great example of that, where this is a B movie and everything is really just budget. And and even then, Peter Jackson took that budget and did the absolute best that he possibly could and put it into all the things that mattered and not into the things that didn't. Like the sets and locations in this movie are relatively mundane. They're usually houses or just inside of rooms. It's really all in the practical effects and the acting of Lionel's character, uh, Lionel's actor, Timothy Baum. There's one moment where the filmmaking, I was like really digging it this time, is in the basement scene where it's at super good lighting. And there's one, I can't remember the exact context. It's been a few weeks since we watched it now, but like blood flies up and hits the light bulb and the light bulb is like moving around as I, I guess he's probably getting attacked by zombies <laughs> and has to do the thing where... He injects his mom in the nostrils <laughs> with oh the. Uh, my God. Jeff loved this. <laughs> this is my. Uh, this was actually my favorite thing in the movie was the fact that every time he put gave her the sedative, he for some reason had to put it in her nostrils. <laughs> I didn't know like what why like for the first time I was like oh maybe that's just where there was like a hole in the mask that the mom was wearing, <laughs> but no it's just. Like every single time they keep doing, even at the end when he's giving her like the fatal, the final dose. one. <laughs> Jeff the and I were like, <laughs> we're like, we're like on the edge of our seats, like in the nose, in the nose, in, in, the, in nose! the nose. <laughs> like, it was just such a great moment in watching this movie, and that's like why I say it's like an amusement park where it's like something you can keep coming back to, and it's only going to be fun because of the memories you have of it. And it's just, otherwise, it's just a silly little movie. And I don't know, it's just, it's so great that that the man who made Lord of the Rings, like, this is his beginnings, is this disgusting, record-holding splatter fest. Last third of the movie at the house party. I, like, I can't, I can't even begin to describe how ridiculous it is. I was going to say that B movies have, I feel like, a much wider swath of complexity than A list movies do. We have dramas, comedies, romantic comedies, you know, action, action comedies, action films, exactly. Buddy comedies. And, like, it's very formulaic when you get up in the A list movies because, I mean, it makes sense. Those make movies make a ton of money. Or they're critically well liked, or they're well liked by audiences. You know, it's like a business in the sense that you don't change the products that are making you money. But B movies always have the sense of adventure where it's like they're actually trying to do something a little bit different and break the mold of genre in a sense. And I think Dead Alive does that really well while also. Yes, like you were saying, Jesse, being just a ridiculous, ridiculous movie. The party scene is pretty crazy. <laughs> it goes it goes so much farther than you would ever, ever think. Yeah. At least like in, in every way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't I, I don't even know. 
I'm looking for this one line. I had it in my notes, but it it's it's gone. But I was looking through the quotes because there are so many amazing quotes. Like we've talked about the the priest. He's also like, I kick ass for the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> and then he just does kung fu. <laughs> Yeah, he just knows kung fu out of nowhere. It's like any time the scene, uh, a scene could be taken up a notch, it is. Any time a scene could do with a little bit of salt and pepper, immediately it gets that in a way that still you're not even expecting to where it makes you laugh or lean back or just like put your hands on your head and go, like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> yeah, It's like, it's so wonderful and also just so sticky and wet and disgusting of a movie damn Every- fine custard <clears throat> rich and creamy just the way i like it <laughs> oh i wanted to uh, yeah i was gonna say when alex was talking about that scene i was gonna ask him like what do we need another one <laughs> what, like what do we need more what do we need another one another what we need, a- we need another war oh, oh we God. need what we need is another war and you're like okay that's that character <laughs> like what that's classic yeah another um another amazing line <laughs> That's my mother you're pissing on. Oh, God. Oh, my God. She reaches up it's from just... the grave, castrates gout. whoever is up there. Well, she, like, yeah, the punk is presumably. the punk, and she she brings him down. It, presumably castration, yeah. but <laughs> you just see him, like, gyrating and gesticulating in, like, an insane, like, Looney Tunes fashion and blood just flying up out of the grave before the mother just jumps out. It's like he's in, like, a washing machine of, like, soil and grave dirt or whatever. Yes, it is. It's like a washing machine. (laughs) It's ridiculous. There's just so much inspiration here down to, like, the tiny little aspects of, like, each character, like... The fact that I can see so much of, and here's our video game reference to the episode, I can see so much of, like, the Resident Evil type antagonists, these unstoppable forces of just more and more mutative disgustingness (laughs) that happen in all the games that, like, you can't ever stop. You just keep trying to slow, and, and but they just keep following you. And that was such a great theme in this movie of the mother character, which I guess speaks to your point, Alex, that you were trying to say before about, uh, this like kind of carrying on this theme of this kind of being too attached to your mother is like even in this like zombified state her constant goal is just to be near him yeah and so she just relentlessly pursues him the entire movie becoming more and more of a disgustingly hideous beast yeah and at the end he symbolically escapes so it's a very nice coming of age tale for young lionel i mean it, you know through, if you look at through her zombified womb if you look through her zombified womb yeah if you look at the serious aspect of the film where it's like really trying to tell like a a normally received narrative story it would be lionel leaving the nest you know and finally he it's just that he needs to go through something so drastic for him to carry on with his life because at one point i mean his girlfriend leaves him and she starts hanging out with another dude in town you know roger Roger, of course. Roger. He's like just talks about playing football the whole yeah. time. Yeah, we, we all know a Roger. Yes, we do. We know many Rogers. We have known many Rogers. So, it's like Lionel really needed something to snap him out of it and be able to uh, carry on with the the woman that he loved. But interspersed into that narrative. There's a f- there's a few <laughs> drops of blood here. A and few there. other things. Yeah. A few weird characters. <laughs> There's some other characters that my brain is thinking about. There's the um really strange vet that they go to. He's there for one scene. Do you guys remember this oh, character? Yes. yes, yes. The uh the the, the Nazi oh, essentially. Yes, 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 Call him what yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. Yep, the Nazi The vet. apothecary. The Nazi vet, I say with air quotes. Yeah where he was more like a Nazi doctor who now can only practice veterinary medicine in America. Yeah, and you're like, what the fuck? And then that character you never see again. You have the, uh, I loved like, I don't know where Paquita and her grandparents are from, but they're just like oh. such standard, like Eastern European like archetypes. Jeff was laughing about the, 
the the grandpa especially they're like <laughs> oh, gypsy archetypes he, yes yeah he was just he was just like this sweaty like like wife beater wearing just like what the, does it make money with food dribbling with cabbage soup dribbling out of his <laughs> uh, poorly shaven mouth like it was just so it was so generically gypsy and i don't know i just I, it was either peter jackson making some kind of point or just being like Haha, our gypsy's dumb what about uh i don't know which one lionel's uncle oh yeah God. this is another amazing character who is really just a sexy beast you know? when he calls her when he calls paquita the foreigner because he can't like she won't hook up with him that scene was just rich with that like old world old generation racism he immediately is just like where's this bloody foreigner he's so fucking disgusting like peter jackson and that actor whoever he was did an amazing job making you just disgusted by this guy as soon as he walks into frame the first time you're like oh god you look like you look like the baron from dune as like Hunter Thompson would have called him a caricature of a used car salesman, you know. <laughs> yeah, the like the one vest. one who's been eating cheeseburgers for thirty seven years. <laughs> yeah, I I really loved his character and hated him at the time. He reminded me of just this like disgusting, horrifying toad that just sat, sits there, just just like taking the easiest, fattest flies. It's just he's so gross, and he's kind of worse than anything practically like the practical effects you see in the movie or anything like that. I mean, he's the villain that you see. In he the movie. is the villain of the story. Oh, for like, sure. Not even the zombies are for the sure. villains or anything like that. I mean, the second he discovers like uh, Lionel's plight, his immediate like ag- idea is to go ahead and try to uh, exploit it for mm-hmm. profit. He's like, well, I'll call the cops if you don't sign over the rights to the house and whatever to me and your mother's, fortune to Mm -hmm. me and it's just like the money and the house it it's just so gross and you're and you you you're so waiting for him to get destroyed in the way that you know he's going oh but it takes a long time he's like he's like a zombie slayer extraordinaire for a while he's like he does yes he does and then this this is the point too like he becomes one of the interesting zombies, like like you talked about before, how all the zombies have this like personality towards the end, and I love how there's it's almost like they're sub bosses, you know. Before the main boss, that's the mom. You have um, you have the moment where after Lionel does the famous lawnmower scene where it has all the blood on planet Earth, and then like the punk zombie, I think his name is Void, like comes down and he has like the the thing where he's been cut in half. But he's still like he's like has his torso balanced on his legs somehow. I don't even know how to describe yeah. it. Yeah. But he's like a sub boss and it's funny. And then the uncle is like his spine, like his head and spine are torn out in the air. I don't even know how to describe this. <laughs> you're like it's I'm like doing a terrible just, job. <laughs> you sound like a little kid trying to describe like his favorite superhero <laughs> movie and he's like four. Yeah. And he's like and the little and then the guy came and he had the head that comes out and it was hanging off the top and you couldn't tell that it was hanging off the top. <laughs> it's just like the fuck are you talking about? And I've seen the movie. Like it's Yeah. Like, I, I mean I, but I, I do digress. agree with you. That there is kind of like your archetype of like you fight the little like mini boss uh, zombies before you finally are able to destroy the uh, the great beast by in- yet again injecting her in the nose with tranquilizer. <laughs> yeah, no sedatives. I think the end is interesting only because. Do you mean when the guts become sentient and chase him up the? Uh... Oh god! Up into the attic. No, that part was hilarious. Though that had some alien. You could easily be making any. That had some alien vibe stuff to it. You know, the like face, the what is the face crawlers from Aliens? Oh, the face huggers. The face huggers. That's what it is. Face crawlers. I also (laughs) like that scene in the in the attic because it's like you get a little break from the chaos and you also get some explanation, like because it's set up earlier in the movie that. Uh, his father died by drowning, but then his you learn, mom did it. yeah, you learn that his mom did it, and you find that like his dad was having an affair, and it has all these nice little pictures of him and him and his lady friend, 
and then it just yeah. sh- shots it shoots for one second to a picture of him like just feeding her the most ridiculously huge hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you're like, that was you're like, this you movie was for you. Couldn't even like l- have one minute where something comedic didn't happen. You know, it's like yeah. it's like the reveal and has the dramatic music and boom, guy feeding a girl a, a hot dog with no <laughs> bun, just just and her face is just like, ah, yay, hot dog. I was oh, gonna man. say about the end though, I, th- I thought it was interesting that they look at the fire. You know, because the house is, like, burning down. And him and Paquita just walk away. And I always wondered, like, what would be the practical or, like, realistic implications of that? A, where are they going? Mm -hmm. B, what happens to, like, your possessions and things like that? Like, do you think you could realistically walk away from a situation like that? Or do you think there'd be like a lot of paperwork you'd have to sign after? Maybe Peter Jackson needs to make a sequel. <laughs> isn't the world like over? Like, isn't are, do all the zombies die because the main one does? I think it's the implications. Yeah. Like most of them have been ground into hamburger anyway, and then the house oh, okay. is on fire, and she falls into the fire. So I think the implication yes. is like there's no zombies left, and then like the house collapses. Okay. Cool. I'd love to see well, like a like a sequel that's thirty years later, and it's just um, Timothy Balm and that actress Paquita just like living their life, but they're like traumatized. <laughs> I was about to say just them in therapy together, <laughs> right? And them like, trying like, them in therapy, trying to explain like probably worse than I'm even able to <laughs> what the fuck happened. Like that they're they're all like on like. They like there's a scene where they just open up their each their own respective medicine cabinets and it's just this library of pill bottles <laughs> and medications that they're all on antipsychotics. Oh and my god! Like, they're just trying their hardest to cope with this like horrendous PTSD of watching these people like become who they became. <laughs> Uh, Imagine really, trying to get insurance. I on love all this that shit whenever too. we come up with like an idea for a movie, it's like the most miserable thing ever. Every time <laughs> you're like, we want to have Gene Hackman play a 95 year old Superman just decked out in this fortress of solitude, or like the Wilson one, where he's just yeah, like <laughs> the suicide mode. <laughs> I mean, it's just because the best thing to do in a super high fantasy type movie situation is just bring it screeching back down to yeah. reality that's great oh boy but yeah dead alive is just that type of movie where it's one of those that, where you can watch it every year with your buddies and uh and a bunch of bottles of beer and and whiskey and just have a have a good old time and it'll never get old it might be the most fun movie i've ever seen it's pretty fun it does this style better this splatter style the best than any movie I've seen try to do it. It's like, I mean, the only thing I can compare the ridiculousness of the gore to is something maybe like Riccio or like a Cronenberg type movie where it's just like the, the gore. But even in Cronenberg, it's not really gore. It's more like weird body horror. Whereas yeah, this and it's like much more much, understated. Yeah, it's like in this is like how much blood can we pump out of a a doll with our current technology. <laughs> yeah, and a really good looking doll too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. A really good looking one. I have one more quote from the movie, and this cinched What's it. That? I was like, "Oh, this is perfect." You know what they're saying about you, don't you? You've gone funny in the head, a real bloody weirdo. Uh, yep. Oh, there it is. I, did, I, I did like that. I do remember when we heard that when we were watching it because me and Jesse watched this together. <laughs> that we both kind of turned to each other and we're like, oh, yeah, we're dumb. <laughs> and then like <laughs> really wanted to dumb. immediately hang ourselves afterwards. <laughs> and we still do, but I love it. <laughs> we'll call this episode <laughs> Real Bloody Weirdos, Dead Alive. <laughs> yeah, that should be perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a movie that needs over-explication or over-explanation no. at all. I think we've uh, pretty well lined out why it's amazing. It's, uh, it's just, it's like... Yeah, if you if you like comedy violence and gore and stuff like that, like movie gore, it is it is just the most fun thing that you can see. I am yeah, it's 
It's definitely the the pinnacle of of splatterfest comedy and just silliness and over the top humor. It's it's a good one. Yeah, there are some movies that are like that are sort of in the same category ish that that I'll, we'll we'll be talking about eventually. Like Toxic Avenger is up there from Beyond yeah. and Reanimator stuff like that, but. I'm not sure any of them quite touch Dead Alive. Well, that's good that we did it first because then we set the standard. Exactly. Exactly. Well, before we wrap up this week, you guys have any recommendations? Recommendations? Well, I mean, I don't have any recommendations really, but I did start watching that Squid Game that everyone's talking about. Oh, yeah. Fill us in. Uh, I mean, I just watched the first episode. I mean, I can't really fill people in on more than what's already been memed to death about the show. I right. mean, the show is so heavily fucking memed, it's ridiculous. I've tried to stay away from the memes for this show. Yeah. I want to see I mean, it's it. Prob- it's probably good. I mean, it's 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 well done. You know, I just thought it was relevant to bring up because of our history with, you know, Korean cinema. And it's definitely has the elements of Korean horror that we all really love. You know, that kind of psychological horror and the like funny over the like what we consider over the top acting of certain characters and so yeah you know it's essentially you know debtors are all kind of conscripted in one way or another to participating in a game that's a child like a series of children's games and they realize that like if you're eliminated from the game you're killed and so, and is it like, like prize- is it a uh, do they do they go into visual detail with the kills is it implied it's- like it it's it's like midline like you know like the first one i saw was just like they play red light green light and like you know there's people who like kind of have nothing to live for so they kind of start to get into it really quickly and like they get like okay i don't give a fuck about well, what's the tone is the tone serious it's very serious the movie's very dark and like meant to be very like scary it's meant to be like a korean psychological thriller okay i should watch this it definitely has elements of comedy it's like Battle Royale. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In a way that's like well done and fun. It's extremely well shot. Uh, all the actors are very convincing. It, it definitely has like those actors we like. It has the type of the traditional archetype of like the dad who is like the deadbeat dad who really can't get it together for his daughter and stuff. So things we've seen before. Uh, Damn. Yeah, I, I recommend it. I think it's fun. I think it's a fun show. I mean, beyond all how the far hype and through the memes, you or how far I just through watched you? the first episode. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> how far through you? I mean, how far is that the question? How, how far do answer? you want me to be? <laughs> um, I, I only watched the first episode. I just, I was just getting a taste for it. Um, and that's the one that's like the one that everyone has like talked about the most, the red light, green light episode. Yeah. Um, obviously watch it in Korean with subtitles. Oh, of course. Um, yeah, I don't know. Don't, I, that's don't so much I can do, say. don't do dubs. Don't ever do yeah. dubs, people. I mean, there's there's times you can do dubs. You if you're know. watching the original Godzilla, watch it dubbed, because otherwise it's boring. The movie is fun Bebop. because it's dubbed. Yeah, Cowboy Bebop has good dubs. Like you know, there's certain things. I think that anime is more forgivable because it's like you can you can look past it more easily. I think like with real film, especially, it's it just looks weird. It feels weird. It feels <clears> off. Definitely. Yeah. I don't yeah. Know. You get into like old kung fu movie territory. See that sure. that can be fun. I mean, it, it can it, yeah, it, it can be fun, but it's it's yeah. it's ridiculous that it's both like in their shitty comedy movies, but also in their serious movies. When you have yeah. the dubs, it's always just because the so dubs bad. can make it campy. Yeah. You know, there's another word that we can use in our like galaxy of delineations, like what's campy or not. Like holy shit. Yeah, but I mean, that's my recommendation. I mean, I'm not really recommending it because everyone's watching. It's the number one mo- thing on Netflix right now. But we know, I, we know you're not recommending it because it's popular. But I'm, re- but I'm recommending it because I actually think it does hold a lot of the the classic uh, strengths that make Korean horror and Korean cinema so so good right now. Dope. I'll check it out. Um. So this isn't a recommendation either. Okay. And like Jeff, I'm only like halfway through it, but I'm watching Stargate. Um, oh, fucking asshole. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> By the great Roland Emmerich. Exactly. You mean um, the film, right? Not the show? Yes, the film. Uh, I've never like delved into the Stargate like canon or world or anything like that. Um, 
never got into the show. Um, I'm sure it's pretty cool. The movie, I don't know where it sits in this canon. Like, I don't know if it came out after. Yeah, I think it sits well was... under everything else quality-wise, at least. Yeah, but I mean, like, timeline-wise, as far as int- introducing s- the Stargate universe to a public or general audience on film. Like, was it a book? Was it, I know nothing it about it. T- it was a TV show, and then they made a movie later. I'm pretty uh, okay. sure, actually. Wait, I don't know. wait, wait. I think it was a movie and then a TV show. Yeah, my yeah. I, my wife is, is one of her 1994 favorite 1994 and then 90, yeah. yeah. So okay, the film so I'm watching, I'm watching their very first iteration yes. of it then. Okay, yes. so it is, uh, it's pretty classic Roland Emmerich. Um, James Spader is in it. Uh, Kurt Russell, name? baby. David Spader is that Kurt, his name or Kurt, James? James, Spader? James Spader and Kurt Russell. Yeah. Kurt, David, Kurt, David Spader. Oh Jesus Christ, David Spade. <laughs> uh, fuck. That was a me moment. Yeah, it was. I'm sure we um, all love Kurt Russell, right? Yeah, like, no, I like Kurt, Kurt, Russell, Kurt Russell, but in, in this movie, it's it's just bad. I don't know. It's it's a pretty ridiculous movie so far. Um, well, this was Roland Emmerich's trial run for uh, Independence Independ- Day. It basically is like all of that wrapped up in like you have like the government doing its thing, and that's where Kurt Russell is. He's like really clean cut and stuff like that. Um, he's like a very like jaded government top secret military guy whose son accidentally shot himself with a gun so he has like that weight on his shoulders gives him a nice like steely edge i like how you're like going so deep into this movie you've seen half of yeah no i'm <laughs> at the give halfway us, mark like, dude the it's other, two like, hours half and give us the other half next week <laughs> i mean i might like it it just is like you have to finish it now right oh i do i'm, gonna, I'm probably gonna do do that tonight but I was thinking of the term brain candy. Remember we were talking about this term? Yeah, in the mummy episode. Yeah, we talked about it before that as well, though. And I feel like we've uh, always ascribed it to movies that are decent or actually good. Mm -hmm. But I feel like this is also in that same sense where it's like like eating a hot dog from 7-Eleven. Right. Uh, I think that's a pretty good definition of Stargate. Yeah, you know what it's going to taste like. You know how cheap it is. It's so laid out, plain and bare for you. There's no thinking involved with unraveling this hot dog, you know? <laughs> it's like, it's just, I don't know. There's it's something about junk. it, though. It's yeah, junk. but I'll continue to consume movies like this for some I reason. Think, I think we uh, have perfectly figured out a, an analogy for Roland Emmerich's entire filmography. Yeah, it's just like a Seven Eleven like, hot dog. You no, know, just go to the go to the like the like instant food section of Seven Eleven and pick something. Yeah, and you'll be about as satisfied as watching an old Roland Emmerich film. Yeah, all his movies are bad, and they're all basically the same movie. I mean, they all have the same tone. They have the same elements. It's just like prepackaged, annoying Spielbergian schlock without any of the shit that makes Spielberg interesting or good. Yeah. You like approach it with that expectation too, right? You don't like go, no one goes to McDonald's, or excuse me, 7 Eleven, gets one of those spicy chicken sandwiches, puts it in the microwave, and you have to press the number four mm. for 45 I seconds. Fuck with those. Yeah. I used to fuck with those They're so good. hard. They're good. But. <laughs> Anyways, you you don't go in there, do that, and then eat it, and then be like, "Oh, this was disgusting." I'm gonna write a Yelp review, or I'm gonna. Oh complain, my god! Right? Like, He's directing Stargate again. Wait, An archaeologist what? and a group of Marines discover a portal to another world. Roland Emmerich is directing a new Stargate. That's just Stargate, I guess. He's gonna do the funny. He's games gonna thing? do it again or something. Is it Stargate? Or it's just is called it, Stargate. Oh, okay. So he's making the same movie with the same title. Probably will be even worse somehow. Yeah. Starring Brad Archie or something. I don't know. We'll find out. Just do Kurt Russell again. Yeah. So to anyone out there that's into that, you know, 90s sci-fi, just straight consumable edible garbage, 
do it. Vaguely, vaguely movie. edible. <laughs> yeah. Consumable if you're okay with like Seven Eleven levels. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I watch a bunch of shit. Some of them I want to save actually because I watch some really good stuff. I watch like The Hidden Fortress by Kurosawa, which might be his least talked about masterpiece. <clears throat> but I'm gonna go ahead and recommend Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, which I had not seen. Fucking 1958. Christ. It has Paul Newman, a young Paul Newman, as this alcoholic. It's based on a Tennessee Williams uh, story, play. Sorry, yeah, play. And uh, it's just all in this one house. It's a ridiculously dysfunctional family finding some way to like live with each other to some degree. And it's a uh, it's brilliantly shot, brilliantly acted. I guess it it got a lot of flack at the time because the Tennessee Williams play, like the source material, had um, like the main character have all these like homosexual tendencies that the movie <laughs> just completely excised because come on, it was Hollywood in 1958. 1958 yeah yeah <laughs> but um i wasn't thinking about that while watching it i was just like wow this is a really like depressing but incredibly real human drama and i fucking loved it i loved it in the same way that i love um oh god god damn it what's it called marlon brando's breakout performance um also a tennessee williams play i believe not Help the wild here. ones but on no. the waterfront no, or, not the uh, waterfront. Um, streetcar yeah, named street desire. Streetcar named desire. Yeah, that yeah, is Tennessee. Streetcar Williams. named desire. Yeah, so it's it's it reminded me of that for a very good reason, right? Because it's also like a really depressing but like really human stage drama made for the screen, and it's um it's just brilliantly made, and I I recommend it. Can I ask you something about this movie? Please. Your favorite character is Big Daddy, right? Big Daddy is super interesting. Burl Ives is just one of my favorite actors from that era. Yeah, the way that he grills his son and the way that he evolves during the course of this like two hours that the movie takes place in from not understanding the delineation between material wealth and love Mm -hmm. and then finally understanding it is like, damn, it's very impactful. Kind of like Giant. Kind of like Rock, Giant, our, our other character. favorite movie that takes yeah. four times as long <laughs> <laughs> to do the same thing. Uh. All right. Ugh. Well, then. Well, then. Let's uh, end it in our normal, awkward, stumbly way. Well, we'll edit it down. Bye bye. Chicka chaka chapo. Now our podcast is done. And we have to run. We know it is sad, but we had so much fun. Don't be bereft, Jesse, Alex, and Jeff. We'll be back real soon. The real weirdos. We talk about movies for way too goddamn long. Boo-boo-boo-boo. 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 Boo-boo-boo-boo.